Hello, brothers and sisters. Jerry O'Donnell here with Four Angels Messages once again. This message is part 32 of our series, which is coming to a close. This one <clears throat> has the title of John, the Son, and Mary, the Mother. Before we get into the message, let's take a moment in prayer. Our Father, thank you so very much for, again, the opportunity the freedom that we have right now to enter into thy word. And I pray that we would take advantage of this time as the closing scenes are fast approaching, even now engaged. I pray that we would have your Holy Spirit to guide us in truth, convicting us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. May we truly see thy word clearly and form the characters that we need to have in these days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> All right, once again, as usual, repeating our two opening paragraphs of why we're doing this. The Desire of Ages, page 83, paragraph 4 states, It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones, as we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us. Our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If we would be saved at last, we must learn the lesson of penitence and humiliation at the foot of the cross. In First Selected Messages, page 406, paragraph 1, We want to understand the time in which we live. We do not half understand it. We do not half take it in. My heart trembles in me when I think of what a foe we have to meet and how poorly we are prepared to meet him. The trials of the children of Israel and their attitude just before the first coming of Christ have been presented before me again and again to illustrate the position of the gospel, or I mean, the position of the people that is of God in their experience before the second coming of Christ. How the enemy sought every occasion to take control of the minds of the Jews, and today he is seeking to blind the minds of God's servants, that they may not be able to discern the precious truth. So with these, as you would say, marching orders, let us go forward into this current lesson, which is based on John 19, 25 to 29. It could actually be a little shorter because we have already repeated some of these, this content uh, before, or I should say uh, stated the content before, and it's just going to be read to finish it out. <clears throat> so turn with me to John, the 19th chapter. Starting in verse 25, we read... Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, <clears throat> now before I say what that is, here in verse 26, where it says, without saying, this is John, he describes himself of whom Jesus loved. And a lot of people think that <clears throat> this is the closest disciple that he had, and therefore he's bragging that he's the one that Jesus loved. He didn't love as much as others of the group. Of course, the homosexual community takes this verse and says, see, this shows that there was a homosexual relationship <clears throat> between Jesus and John. The true understanding of this is that John is overwhelmed with being known as the son of thunder and having a change of character and the patience that Jesus showed John he is overwhelmed that he could actually be forgiven of his sins and that 
<clears throat> God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son for us. He is overwhelmed that he would receive such love, that even he himself, how horrible a person he was, can be loved. And that should comfort our souls as well, because there is not a sin that is so dark that cannot be forgiven and Jesus truly loving us and calling us brother. Now, this is what Jesus said to his mother towards John. Woman, behold thy son. What do you mean? That's not her son. This is a moment in time in which Jesus is trying to still take care of his mother, though he's in a very helpless situation. It's not like he can take get down from the cross at this moment in time. She is up there in age. Um, his half-brothers and half-sisters aren't... Um, as open to taking care of this woman because this woman, Mary, is not really their mother. So why should they bother? That doesn't mean they didn't have some type of uh, possible uh, feelings for Mary. And who knows, maybe... Um, um, Mary did not have as much time to influence the child. Because remember, Joseph was married prior. Evidently, we're assuming that she died. And so Joseph is getting remarried. The children are older in age as compared to Jesus. There's a bit of a distance. And so there's not that close relationship between those adopted children, if you would, stepchildren, towards Mary. Mary did raise Jesus. Um, and therefore, with Joseph being dead, Jesus is concerned about his mother, who will take care of her as she continues to age. And so, he is declaring to his mother, please treat John as your son. Then he turns around in John 19, 27 and says, Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And he is to take at that point that that means he is to treat Mary as his own mother. We don't know if John's real mother still is around, but this we do know that from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Because uh, it's very challenging for an aged woman, single, to survive on her own, trying to maintain a home and a lifestyle as it is a male-dominant uh, and youthful environment as far as survival. I mean, it's doubtful that uh, women were fishers of um, going out uh, fishing, that is. Uh, could she have dropped a hook? Yes, but carrying a net? No, she's too frail. Uh, working in the fields day in and day out, uh, quite challenging for an older woman, if you would. But nonetheless, John uh, is to take her in. Now, after this, in John chapter 19, 28, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, he took care of the last thing he was uh, concerned about, as well as fulfilling everything that he was to fulfill, that everything of his life that was predicted to have happened was done, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So that's the primary thing here of the accomplishment, that every point that the Messiah was to fulfill, it was done. He says, I thirst. 
Now, in verse 29, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge of vinegar and put it to his, it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Um, and so that's where we're going to leave it at. And uh, we already covered the vinegar part before, and we're not going to worry about that right now. We're focusing on his care to his mother. There he is dying on the cross. The last thing any human, uh, unconverted human, let's put it this way, would ever be thinking, there you are lying in the hospital bed, uh, dying of cancer in excruciating pain. Jesus felt pain. Uh, uh, you know, nails through your hands and feet. Uh, and after what he went through with, with the scourging, everything. Um, he's in extreme pain. Um, it's just undescribable. That, and, and I just shudder the thought that that's what he went through. Uh, I can't imagine such pain. The last thing anybody would be thinking about is with the future of anybody. Uh, I have witnessed uh, a number of people on their deathbed, uh, including my, my own dad, father-in-law, and uh, they're just counting down the moments until they take their last breath. They're not thinking... Uh, I know my own dad did not, you know, say it to me that, uh, you know, Jerry, take care of your mother, uh, being the oldest son, and which I would gladly do. But with that in mind, I, I'm just trying to share with you that when somebody is at at the death place, at the point of death, the last thing you're thinking about is the life of other, uh, other people, uh, let alone his own mother. But he did. And so what I would like to share, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, is two paragraphs from the Desire of Ages on page 752, paragraphs two and three, related to this. And you would think of all the parallels, how I would include this as part of the closing scene, yet it's very important. We'll see. As the eyes of Jesus wandered over the multitude about him, one figure arrested his attention. At the foot of the cross stood his mother, supported by his disciple John. You know, and she's bewailing. She's, the, you know, crushed. She's what? A person that um, loses a child, which I have, not a grown child, and I've witnessed others that have had an older child that died. It is excruciating. And so it, she can hardly stand. It's not her age that she can't stand. She's just overwhelmed with grief. She could not endure to remain away from her son. And John, knowing that the end was near, had brought her again to the cross. In his dying hour, Christ remembered his mother, looking into her grief-stricken face, and then upon John he said to her, Woman, behold thy son. And then to John, behold thy mother. John understood Christ's words and accepted the trust. He at once took Mary to his home and from that hour cared for her tenderly. O pitiful, loving Savior, amid all his physical pain, here we go, and mental anguish, he had a thoughtful care for his mother. He had no money with which to provide for her comfort, but he was enshrined in the heart of John, and he gave his mother to him as a precious legacy. Thus he provided for her that which she most needed, 
the tender sympathy of one who loved her because she loved Jesus. And in receiving her as a sacred trust, John was receiving a great blessing. She was a constant reminder of his beloved master. The perfect example of Christ's filial love shines forth with undim luster from the mist of ages. For nearly 30 years, Jesus, by his daily toil, had helped bear the burdens of the home. And now, even in his last agony, he remembers to provide for his sorrowing widowed mother. The same spirit will be seen in every disciple of our Lord. See, here we go. There's definitely a parallel. Those who follow Christ will feel that it is a part of their religion to respect and provide for their parents from the heart where his love is cherished. Father and mother will never fail of receiving thoughtful care and tender sympathy. Now, at the same time, though we are to have sympathy and care for our parents, of which both of mine died, uh, one in 2017 and the other one at the beginning of this year, both from cancer. Nonetheless, we are told in scriptures that According to Luke 14, 26, if any man can, uh, come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this sounds contradictory. Hate, in this context, I've heard explained as love less. My focus on it is that if any of those hold us back from a relationship of Jesus Christ, we are to hate their efforts and not submit to those. So therefore, if especially towards a teenager, because typically uh, 12 and above is when people want to choose to uh, a life with Christ. And if it differs from the parents, you are not to, if they command you to stay away from the church, uh, stay, stop reading your Bible, any of those things, um, stop paying tithe, you are not to obey your parents. Respect, yes. You don't disrespect them in your disagreement with them, but you do not submit to them over God's requirement. Likewise, wife and children draw as well uh, from our duty, and we should not allow that to happen either. And if we happen to have a brother or a sister, which I do, and they are unconverted, and uh, if you want a relationship with them that you have to be a bit worldly, otherwise uh, there's such a rift, as in my case, um, then we are to turn to God first, and as they say, let the chips fall as they may. If choosing to follow God wrecks your life, so be it. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, we have to shun the distractions of this world. That doesn't mean ignore your responsibilities. But some people say, I'd keep the Sabbath, but you know, I, I am scheduled to work to 6 p.m. On, on Fridays, and you know I can't go to my boss and say, hey, can I leave at 3 o'clock or earlier? And if he gives me the ultimatum that you either work to 6 or you're fired, um, I can't be without that job. No excuse whatsoever. No excuse. So there is that in which we struggle with because especially my mother 
hate it, my choice to leave the Catholic Church and become a Seventh-day Adventist. And to the very bitter end, she had that animosity. Right to the point where I think God arranged this situation in which on her dying breath, wanted to gather together Christmas Eve, which would have been 2021 at the time. And we did this conversation through texting. Your sister would like to gather together one last time as a family on Christmas Eve. Are you able to make it? Christmas Eve was Friday. I had replied, could we please move it to Saturday night, Christmas Day, instead? And I never got a reply back. The Sabbath was put right before her face once again, because I had to explain that. I said, unfortunately, it's the, um, for the meeting that is, it is the Sabbath, and I am not willing to break the Sabbath for this gathering because there's going to be alcohol and partying and worldly talk and we're not supposed to be part of that on the sabbath and therefore i asked i never got a reply back and that's the last message uh between my mother and myself and then she died uh january 7th no further communication for uh two weeks and that's the last message on my phone. She hated the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And my brother and sister lived in uh, the same city as her and made sure she was taken care of. And I was in constant communication with them. And they gave me daily updates and, and things like that. And, uh, and the pronouncement when she died. I, because they were so strict, my brother and sister, with the COVID restrictions and uh, vaccinations and things like that, never, ever was able to see my mother. But that doesn't mean I didn't love her. And I wept. I did all that I could physically in trying to encourage her in our conversations when uh, things were definitely looking bleak, uh, that her life was coming to an end. Um, like I said, I gave words of encouragement. So under the circumstances you are given, the question is, are you doing your best if your parents are still alive, elderly, and need assisting? Now, with that in mind, I would also add to the parallel now from Adventist Home, page 360, paragraphs one through four. They're small paragraphs here, and then we'll wrap up the message. This section is called Honor Thy Father and Thy Mother. The obligation resting upon children to honor their parents is a... Uh, is of a lifelong duration. If the parents are feeble and old, the affection and attention of the children should be bestowed in proportion to the need of father and mother. Nobly decidedly, the children should shape their course of action even if it requires self-denial. So that very thought of anxiety and perplexity may be removed from the minds of their parents. Children should be educated to love and care tenderly for father and mother, care for them children yourselves for no other hand can do the little acts of kindness with the acceptance that you can do them improve your precious opportunity to scatter seeds of kindness and that's just it a lot of people throw their parents into a nursing home and wait for the announcement to die um, maybe they visit their parents you know once a week or once a month you know just to keep relations going but a person that's in that condition needs more acts of kindness 
and that's what we are commanded to do. Our obligation to our parents never ceases. You know, when we become 18, we still have an obligation to our parents. Our love for them and theirs for us is not measured by years or distance, and our responsibility can never be set aside. Let children carefully remember that at the best, the aged parents have but little joy and comfort. What can bring greater sorrow to their hearts than manifest neglect on the part of their children? What sin can be worse in children than to bring grief to an aged, helpless father or mother? Again, the requirements of God supersede uh, the requirements of man, but still respect and concern and sympathy ought to be shown where it can be shown. And as the closing scene on the cross, representing the closing scenes of the second coming, we are not supposed to be so caught up in giving the message, especially to the, when we have unconverted parents, that we neglect them. Our acts of kindness are recorded in heaven and our neglect is also recorded. Let us be very careful of which path we choose because remember when the Pharisees um, on this subject they declared that their belongings belonged to God. They said a special prayer on it, and therefore they could not use any of that to take care of their elderly parents. Uh, I think the word was Corbin. Um, nonetheless, we are not to allow that as in, well, I'm dedicating all these funds to to support this ministry or this message or whatever it happens to be. We are to take care of our parents. You know, tithe is different. Tithe is tithe. That that, that is dedicated. But we're talking beyond that. Uh, our means. You're 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 thinking. I could give a thousand dollars to distribute literature, or pay this month's. Um, expenses for my dying parent, um, especially if there's only one parent left, uh, and they, they're running out of, of funds that they're living off of because of medical expenses, I could pay their mortgage or rent or electricity or, or whatever uh, with that. Which do I choose? Uh, aren't we supposed to put God first? Not in this case as far as that type of choice. No. We are we have a responsibility to our um, elderly parents, and we need to be careful in our relationship with our parents, even to the very end. And so, may God direct us. Each case is different. Each case is unique. Only you and God can know what your responsibility is to be, has been. And if you uh, don't have uh, parents anymore, that they are deceased, and you realize, you know, I did not do enough, confess it to God. Between you and God, um, make sure things are, are right. Don't just say, oh, nothing else I can do. They're, they're dead. No. No. Um, we need to repent of all of our sins, that nothing stands in the way, especially before the days that are coming uh, ahead of us. May we think on these very serious things, very emotional things as well, and uh, God be with each one of us. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you again so much for the inspiration that you provide and that each one of us would receive it and act accordingly as your, once again, son has demonstrated that we ought to walk. 
If we say we are Christian, we are to walk as Jesus walked, right to the very end. And I pray that right choices be made and that uh, we would know what those acts of kindness happen to be and know what we ought to confess unto you. And I pray that we would form those characters that we ought to have that are Christ-like and be ready for that great and glorious day. And we ask these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for listening. Until next time, God bless you. Take care.